In this video, I'm going to be giving you the most in-depth tour of the Propedia you're going to find anywhere. This is a special volume within the Encyclopedia Britannica. And I'll be giving you the history. We're going to be going all the way back to 1911 with the classified table of contents. Most people don't know about this, but this was the precursor to the Propedia. This is in the public domain. You can get it. Um, I've got a whole bunch of resources connected to the Encyclopedia Britannica as well. There's a free spreadsheet um, on my website. There's a link in the description if you want to check that out. But uh, let's get into the Propedia. I'm going to take you through. I've marked out all the special features. Um, so you're going to get to see all the unique aspects of what makes this piece so special. So you open it up, got that little cover page, title page. You'll notice it says 30 volumes instead of 32, even though it's the 15th edition. This is because this is the edition that didn't have the two indices at the back, which um, I actually have right here. And I have a separate video. There's a playlist down in the description um, where you can see what's in the index and I show you how the index actually connects to the uh, Propedia. So that's worth checking out. Um, Here's the copyright page. You'll notice this is the 1984 edition, not the 1991. And that's actually important because there's some stuff, there's some stuff in here that is not in the uh, newer version. So a key thing to understand about these editions is that uh, this is the post-World War II edition. Um, you had the 1911 edition, which happened, came before World War I. Then uh, with the 14th edition, that was starting to get stale. So you see the, the dates for the 14th edition, they got a lot of mileage out of that. But the world was changing so much, and then they needed time to redo the whole thing. So the 15th edition basically lasted until... 29, 2009, 2010, they did a global edition, um, and then they've updated it online since then. But um, the whole kind of new world order post-World War II. So for example, this page with which, which uh, Hutchins wrote. So Hutchins and Adler were kind of the tag team. Hutchins became president of University of uh, Chicago when he was like 31 years old and uh, University of Chicago took on ownership of the Encyclopedia Britannica from Sears so the Sears department store actually owned Britannica and they gave it away as a gift um, to University of Chicago and then Hutchins brought in Adler and if you remember Adler was also behind the great books of the Western world, and he wrote the Syntopicon, which is a two-volume um, series at the beginning of the, the great books. Hutchins also wrote a piece that they later took out, which is volume one. It's kind of confusing um, when they went from first edition to second edition, but... Um,
you also get this preface to the 15th edition. This is not in the newer version of the 15th edition. And it kind of goes into the history of everything I'm talking about. And it goes into the, the whole idea they had of putting this together, going back to the uh, classified table of contents. The classified table of contents was an attempt, and it was kind of, it was actually two table of contents. So there was the classified table of contents, which is a table of contents of other table of contents. Um, you then get into classified list of articles, which is the actual thing. And it doesn't tell you what volume to go to for everything, but it does have a list of all the different articles under a certain, um, big category here, anthropology and ethnology, and then art. So there's subcategories of art. You have general architecture. Then it gets into music. And sub areas of music, instruments, biographies, etc. And then within those lists, it's alphabetical. So that's what they were making do with. Um, but it wasn't, it was or only organized to those top like three levels. So uh, there's this preface in here and they go into basically they wanted to create a, and this was really Adler's um, brainchild. He wanted to create a full outline. So this is the end of the uh, preface by Priest. And then you have Adler right there, director of planning. So this Propedia was actually a planning document. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that. Um, there's this helpful thing here that explains how everything is organized. And the idea basically was that you weren't going to have an index. Instead, you are going to use the micropedia as your starting point, or you are going to use the propedia. So you're going to go in here in the micropedia, which is all the short articles. So everything is short. Everything is two or three paragraphs. Some are a little bit longer, but mostly it's two or three paragraphs. Sometimes you get a page or two on something. I did a separate video just on this. But you would go in here and then it would give you further reading and it would sometimes link you up to something in the uh, Macropedia. But really, you'd come to the Propedia, you'd crack it open to this area you were interested in and then you'd use that to find a longer article in the Macropedia. So right here, now we're getting into the actual outline. He then gets into this whole circle of learning thing. And this goes back to, uh, I mean, people have always been working on stuff like this, but in, uh, Roger Bacon, was big into that. He influenced the encyclopedia uh, or encyclopedia uh, with the French encyclopedia that came um, into being around the time of the French Revolution. So he explain he, he gives these diagrams which are a little bit hard to understand, but uh, these are the 10 parts. And the first nine parts are kind of the major areas. And then part 10 is a meta which we'll talk about in a bit. Just to give you an overview, these are the 32 volumes in the Encyclopedia Britannica. So the first 12 are the Micropedia. Then you've got 17 in the Macropedia. 
then you've got the Propedia, and then you've got the two indices. And within the Propedia, you've got 10 parts, 42 divisions, and 189 sections. I'm going to show you what those mean in a second. And then within each section, there's subjects. So each major subject, and there's at least two of them, has a capital letter. And there's up to three levels of additional subdivision underneath each major section. I mean, each major subject. So this is the end of Adler's explanation of everything. Um, he basically gets into the, those 10 groupings and the different ways of thinking about it. Uh, and he, he kind of makes it, makes a reference to a tense, like it's a two dimensional diagram there, but he's really trying to get you to imagine a 10 sided uh, polyhedron. And so for those of you who are interested, it's not one of the platonic solids. There's these five. And there was only five of these, so it's good to know these. Um, tetrahedron, cube, octahedron, dodecahedron, and icosahedron. So there's no 10-sided thing. And I was thinking of the dodecahedron when I was looking at this because I was trying to picture. So there, this is the 10 sided thing, if you were wondering. And uh, here's some other ones. So he's kind of trying to get you to imagine something like that, where each branch of knowledge is a uh, is a perspective of looking at reality. And they're all kind of equal perspectives. So that's just kind of a side thing. Um, this stuff is important in chemistry because it gets into how molecules form. Here's some of Kepler's drawings. So anyways, um, Then there's this two-page thing here about how to use the Propedia. There's a reference system here for how they reference different portions of the page. And then there's an example here of a certain subject and then the three types of reference. So there's articles, those are the major pieces and these only rec these only reference the macropedia the big encyclopedia not the small one the micro so they don't reference anything in the micropedia and um there's three types there's reference to a big article which is the first column then there's reference to sections of an article and then there's other references so what a section of an article is is where there's a table of contents and there's subsections under that article. So social structure and change, and then there's sections underneath that, and there's uh, page numbers for each of those sections. So
that's what it's linking you to. Um, and so we flip to the next page here. And this is the table of contents for the major parts, divisions, and sections. So remember, that's the structure we just talked about. 10 parts, 42 divisions, 189 sections. So those are the first four parts. This is takes you through part eight. And then you have parts nine and 10 rounding things out. And then the end of part 10 right there. And then you immediately get into part one. So for each part, there's an, a big introduction, like a full page or two. So that's the introduction to part one, written by a named author who's an expert. But then there's also uh, an explanation of the different divisions. So there's a little half page here on what are the divisions, and then there's a table of contents of those three divisions. Then for each division, there's an intro to that division, and it it explains what each section is about. And then it goes into the actual content. So that capital A there where it says structure of the atomic nucleus, you see there's an article about that. You, you go down to magnetic mo uh, moment and there's magnetic re uh, resonance there. So when I said earlier that this was a planning document, uh, I meant that literally. They actually created this outline first, and then they assigned articles to writers. And you'll notice... Um, almost every major subject and remember a major subject is where there's a capital letter so b for isotopes c for radioactive nuclei there's almost always there's some exceptions but there's almost always a major article for each major subject then when you have just a regular subject and there's three levels of hierarchy here there's arabic numerals there's lowercase letters, and then there's a third level used only sometimes, which is lowercase Roman numerals. So like right here under number eight, you have chemical elements origins of, and they're referencing an article there. So it's not just uh, major subjects that have a, article dedicated to them and you see these um, I didn't explain the referencing system yet uh, but if you watch the other videos I did explain it there um, so in article section for articles they just give you page numbers for article sections they give you so the bold number is the volume. Then there's a colon, then there's the number of the page, and then there's the letter, which shows you which area of the page it's on. So they split up the page into eighths, and each eighth is assigned a letter. And that was earlier in the video. So that's how the referencing system works. And then uh, here's another example, the arts. 
different types of art. There's literature. If you watch the index video, um, I kind of compared this type of referencing to the uh, index video. So you're definitely going to want to watch that. That's in the playlist that I linked to below. Literature of Western peoples. Literature, comma, Western. So you can see that's a big article. And of course, that's a pet project of Adler. So there's going to be a lot of content there. So that's 1,086 to 1,260. So that's almost, it's like 180 pages. And each page of the Encyclopedia Britannica is about 1,500 words. So you've got over 200,000, probably 225,000 225, words um, just in that range right there. You've also got bi bi biographical references so the most important people, there'll be a reference to them. And these do reference the Micropedia. So this is actually an exception to the rule. So more bibliographic uh, references. And then you get into the next section. So it's, it's very, very, very comprehensive. And part of the reason that they wanted to plan it out like this by creating this organizational structure is that they could avoid duplication because there's a trade-off you have to make between uh, being fragmented and being whole. So fragmentation allows you to create more entries that are smaller and more entry points. So you can take any word you're thinking of, because remember, there's no, the search engine for these books is a combination of the Propedia and which is kind of more of a semantic search, if you're familiar with uh, Google, as opposed to the index, which is more of a keyword based, lower order type of search. And so uh, this was the equivalent of when Google went to semantic search, um, I don't know, five years ago now. And uh, it was a major upgrade. And in AI in general, that that was a major shift um, with natural language processing and other stuff like that. So uh, this is an important section here. Part 10, the final part, knowledge becomes self-conscious. He kind of explains that there's kind of a Hegelian vibe. where he talks about, to some extent, the answer has already been given. Here in part 10, we are concerned with knowledge, become self-conscious with knowledge about knowledge, with our knowing turned reflexively back upon itself. So, He gives you this intro and he kind of picked this out for himself. He, he was referred to, I think Hutchins called him a philosophical rock star, not rock star, um, celebrity in the uh, intro that he wrote or the foreword. Yeah, right here. in addition to his celebrity as a philosopher, Dr. Adler. So 
uh, he took this piece for himself, the sort of filet mignon of the book. And uh, then he gets into the part and the different divisions. He gives like a little paragraph on each division, just like the other ones. And he explains how he brought it, he broke it up into logic, math, science, history and the humanities, and then philosophy. And there is some interesting overlap between kind of how he thinks about religion. So I was, I was looking at it and I was thinking, I wonder if he wrote the religion one also, but he didn't. Um, but I thought it was kind of interesting. I'll show you that page. So that's part eight. Part eight is religion, part nine is history, and part 10 is philosophy. And as you know, with Hegel, he had his philosophy of history. Religion as symbolism. So part 10 goes into, it, it's really, uh, it's really in depth. So if this thing is, is worth its weight in gold. Um, historiography is here as one of the uh, sections. So you have a main article there. Different theories of history, different traditions of history. Different approaches. Archaeology and anthropology. Just very comprehensive, in, just interesting stuff you wouldn't even think of. Um, speculative philosophies of histories of the history of the West. In the West, Greek and Roman, Christian, Islamic, Jewish. Enlightenment. Oriental philosophies of history. Critical or analytical philosophy of history. Thinking is of learning, paideia. So I just did a video on that. Cornell West, Paideia, Homeric Education, Sophus and Socrates, The Turn to Logos, Jordan Peterson, The Beginnings of Rhetoric, Plato and the Academy, Mathematics in the Service of Philosophy, Aristotle and the Lyceum, Hellenistic Scholarship, Roman Ideal of hum Humanitas, Training of the Orator, Conflict of Cultural Ideals, Christianization of Pagan Culture, The Reconciliation of Classical Humanism with Christian Revelation, Scholastic Method, The Distinction of Philosophy from Sacred Theology. Uh, so it just, it really shows you kind of the project Adler was working on. This was really his baby to like really organize all this really high level meta knowledge. 
um, and it's just hugely, hugely valuable. So, uh, each page here is just really interesting. Here's some bibliographic entries. So these all reference, I misspoke earlier, these all reference the Macropedia. The point is that there may also be Micropedia, and there almost certainly is Micropedia entries for all these people. Because if they're important enough to be in the Macropedia, um, they're important enough to be in the Micropedia. So you get to the final division philosophy and uh, just gives you really nice outlines of everything. Got epistemology or theory of knowledge. You've got philosophy of man or philosophical anthropology. This is really important because these are the assumptions that are baked into any psychological theory or any theory of, of the person or of, of a community of man as a mankind. The problem of personal identity through time, the role of self-knowledge and its analysis. The problem of volition, the problem of affectivity. So this gives you a really strong kind of skeleton structure for, uh, that you can then place everything else into. And that's really valuable. So it just goes page after page after page. Um, and the final section is a lot of the key theories, theories of being. That's kind of where, where the rubber meets the road. That's at the most meta level. So it's pretty important to know about all of these. And they're mostly, they're in a somewhat of, of, of historical order. Um, validity of knowledge here, Kantianism, positivism, pragmatism, skepticism, rationalism, empiricism. Deontological, teleological. So it just gives you a really good um, place to start with everything. And then that's the final page. We've got some biographical references. And then it gets into the uh, lists of authors and advisors. So these are all the people that contributed and a little bio of 
their credentials. And what part they contributed to. And then there's the uh, initials. So this is the initials of everybody who contributed to the Macropedia. So these are the people who were part of the uh, large articles that are in the Macropedia. And at the end of each, they put the person's initials. And then the idea is you can look them up here if you want. So one, one of the kind of confusing things about these two different editions of the uh, 15th edition and, and then this, there's just an alternative list here where you don't have the descriptions of their names. So in this later edition, which is these blue books, the uh, Micropedia is the first 12 volumes and then volume 13 through 29 is the Macropedia. In the first version of the 15th edition, which is what this Propedia is references to, um, the Macropedia comes first. That's why when you look in here and there's all these biographical uh, references they're referencing stuff in you know volumes one two three four five six seven and they're in order like that because it's the, the whole macropedia is alphabetically ordered so um But these are not referencing the Micropedia. It's just that when they redid it and added the additional two indices, they put the Micropedia first. So if you get the newest version of the Propedia, it's actually significantly thinner by like, I think, it's 100 to 200 pages thinner than this. And the reason why is because they actually removed all of these references. So all of these um, numerical references to articles and article sections and other things, uh, they just completely removed that. And this part of why I think they did it is because they made a lot of changes once Adler and Hutchins were out of the scene. Um, once they were no longer involved, that was similar to when they did the second edition of the Great Books of the Western World. Uh, they got rid of Hutchins' introductory book and they took it from 52 to 60 volumes. What they did is they chopped off that first volume and they moved up the Syntopicon to the first two, and then they filled those other 58 volumes with, they pretty much kept everything that was in the original uh, 49 of the 52 that was content. Um, they removed, I think, one or two things, and then they added a bunch of stuff which was from the 1900s or the 20th century. Previously, it had stopped at Freud, who was early 1900s, like 1905, 1907 was the final date, I believe. Um, so they changed both the Encyclopedia Britannica 
and the great books of the Western world right around that point of 1990. And you think about it, that's the end of the Cold War. So um, it was kind of the end of the era for Adler and um, Hutchins, and uh i mean this is kind of I've, I've said in some other videos um i'm kind of an amateur book collector and uh it's pretty well known in book collecting but also just kind of in general especially if you study more academic stuff that there's oftentimes stuff in the first edition that's removed in later editions or edits are made a lot of times they're not announced so if you look at the up-to-date version instead of this older version, they don't tell you that stuff is missing. They just remove it and don't say anything. And you could, I don't know what the reason is. There's a lot of changes that happened with the Encyclopedia Britannica where there is no official explanation of why it happened. And it's a private company. So they're not really necessarily transparent about stuff. Um, <laughs> there's a whole kind of shady history of encyclopedia encyclopedia sales going back from basically the 1950s to the 90s and uh it could be as simple as cost cutting some of these companies w had trouble making money um it was sort of a non-profit for-profit hybrid uh the way adler ran it and he would get these various benefactors they were running it as kind of like a nonprofit where they were creating this public good, but at the same time, they had a uh, massive marketing and sales force selling this thing, and uh, they would have problems at time being profitable. So, and then uh, Microsoft and Carta came in. Um, Bill Gates actually wanted to buy or or license. Uh, the Encyclopedia Britannica, they refused to do it. He he created a free alternative. Actually, he licensed a lesser um, encyclopedia. I did a video on it. I'm blanking on the name. But uh, he, he licensed a, a lesser one and then added pictures and multimedia and other stuff, called it Microsoft Encarta. Um, and then Wikipedia happened and those two were kind of the death knell to Encyclopedia Britannica in terms of the print version. They still have an online version and it is pretty good. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, as far as I know, there's no online version of the Propedia in terms of on the Britannica website. And really there hasn't, there wasn't anything like the Propedia before and there really isn't, hasn't been anything like the Propedia since then. So this is a very special document where if you want to develop an encyclopedic mind, you this is required reading. And this is probably the number one thing I'd say anybody should read um, if you want to develop that. And if you want to as well, I'll have a link to the PDF of this, and there's actually a version that's has a white background. The problem is the type is so small that it's really not pleasant to read. And actually, kind of a funny thing, this, this five, if you look at the index in the uh, newer Encyclopedia Britannica, it's four columns. The old school was five columns, so the text was even smaller. Um, and you can just imagine losing your sight slowly as you read stuff like this. Um, but it is worth taking a look at this just to get a sense of how they structured the knowledge. But um, this Propedia also goes hand in hand with the uh, Syntopicon. 
So what the Syntopicon is, is a set of two books. And they cover 102 of the greatest ideas. And so what uh, Adler did is he had a huge team of people go through all of the 49 other volumes of the 52 volume original set and find where in those uh, works each of these themes and sub themes there were 52 themes but if I remember correctly there was something like 500 to a thousand sub themes so like each of those 102 had five or ten uh, un <coughs> underneath it <coughs> as sub themes so he had people go through and this is this is what any indexer who goes through a book and creates the index for the book this is what they do so it's not an unheard of thing but they went through and they indexed all these themes and sub themes for all 49 volumes and i think it's like 500 600 total number of works uh poetry plays sh short stories you know essays montaigne um novels and epics so there's whole variety of of types of stuff in it but he did all that indexing then he went through and looked at all that and he wrote 102 essays on here's this big idea here's some sub ideas for this big idea and here's how you trace that idea through the great conversation which is his big concept for these great ideas it's the conversation of different people in w among the intelligentsia each book they add is kind of their entry into the conversation and ideas get batted back and forth and exchanged and debated and so in each of these essays he's taking you through all these different great works and explaining here's how this idea and these sub ideas show up and you can kind of trace these great ideas through all these different um, great works of uh, the past two, three thousand years. So uh, this Propedia, you know, there's kind of the, if you had to kind of oversimplify it, you could say there's the logical mind and the emotional mind. The logical mind really goes with the Propedia and the Encyclopedia Britannica. And then the other half, because it's it's fact-based, it's factual knowledge for the most part. Uh, there's the philosophical and religious stuff as well, but it's it's factual knowledge. Um, it's not so much experiential. Whereas you go into the great books of the Western world, each of these, some of them are philosophical, so uh, this doesn't apply 100%, but it's you're getting more of the experience of individual authors um, their unique perspective, their unique voice. And you're, in, in, at least in terms of the stories and the narratives uh, and the poetry, you're going in and really experiencing it. Of course, you also have Montaigne in his essays and you have the great philosophical works, which are not as much like that and kind of can even be the opposite of that. Um, but that's kind of how you think about these two collections so uh that's pretty much it uh let me know what you think down in the comments let me know if you have any questions make sure to like and subscribe if you want to get more content like this um make sure you check the description there's going to be a link to the free spreadsheet of all these resources um free editions of the Encyclopedia Britannica, uh, other good stuff on the great books of the Western world and other collections and canons like it. Uh, so, and then there's also the playlist. So there'll be a link to a, the playlist down below as well. And uh, there'll be a link to my website. You can check me out on Twitter um, and sign up for my newsletter at timothykenny.com. Uh, that pretty much covers everything, so I'll leave it there, and I'll see you in the next video.